Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Go check out Pacific War Podcast, week by week. Hosted by yours truly, Craig Watson, in association with Kings and Generals. Found on all podcast platforms, like Spotify. Give it a click. You'll like it. Welcome back to the Pacific War Podcast, the podcast where we cover the entire history of the Asian Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. Today, we're changing up the format a bit. I'm here with some new faces, although maybe you saw them in the speakeasies, that forte, that little thing that went on for a few weeks there. I'll start with, uh, we'll call you Tupa Loops. Hey, how's it going? Glad to be back on the show. And we have, I'll call you Spooner. Yeah, that and, works. Yeah. Or Canada Watch. We'll call you Canada Watch. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, it's nice to be back. Thank you for having me. And we have Mr. Economics as usual in the bottom right hand corner. What's up, everybody? Good to be. And, uh, you know, I thought for this episode, since I have two fellow YouTubers here, maybe we'll start with Tupa Loops. Why don't you just uh, pitch your, your entire YouTube? What do you do? What's your associated channel? by the way as well right yeah i started up a uh, a side channel so yeah i make uh, game reviews kind of like highly edited game reviews with a lot of memes thrown in there and uh, recently i've started a uh, a let's play channel on the side that i've become like very passionate about and uh, play with a friend and we're kind of going for like a kind of like more uh, laid back commentary style and yeah we're putting out new videos every day so uh if you're into that type of thing check it out and he's being really humble audience uh when he started to make his game review videos like i was losing my minds he's on spot with the memes his editing is it's excellent so really i would say like first off check out his game reviews and then if you really like his stuff then venture in and go watch his let's play channel because he's gonna have like how many hours worth of footage you must have at this point it must be crazy i uh, yeah i think i've surpassed you in video count Probably. Probably by a big shot. Yeah. And Canada Watch, why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, hey, it's, uh, my name's Nick, and uh, I uh, run a uh, YouTube channel called Canada Watch. We cover important events in Canadian news, politics, and business. Uh, it's a good way to get uh, kind of more informed about uh, certain issues. We try to follow a little bit of uh, you know, what the Canadian political news of the day, but I really like to dive into issues that really affect like working and middle class people, uh, economic issues, uh, inflation, uh, and also talking about social cultural issues, uh, whether it's uh, use of a certain uh, dependency on certain things or talking about, you know, the right to disconnect uh, from work and things like that. So it's been a lot of fun and uh, really looking forward to keeping at it. Yeah, and I can't stress enough to anyone in my audience who's Canadian, honestly, check it out. It's really cool stuff. And from here on out, we don't have to call me Mr. Economics anymore because we have somebody even better than me. So I can just be Justin and Nick can, uh, Nick can talk numbers even more than I can. He's, uh, he's an old friend and knows a lot about what he's talking about. So good to have you, Nick. And uh, Toops too. Always fun. So... Let's so, get into this week's episode. And since we have some new faces here, and I'll also acknowledge that uh, there's probably a lot of people watching this coming over from Kings and Generals. Uh, I love you guys. The comments have been really nice and sweet. Uh, just to let you know about the format, this podcast basically follows my YouTube series. Uh, if you're an audio listener, the episode literally comes before you hear the discussion, so you already know. But uh, the last episode that I put out was German Raiders of the Pacific during World War I. Key word there, World War I, because as an audience member noted to me, suddenly it's a popular topic to talk about German Raiders in the Pacific, uh, particularly for World War II. 
So it seems like I just kind of hit something while it's hot without knowing. Don't know how that happened. And uh, as always, usually I always start off the podcast by asking my guests, you know, just generally like, what do they think of the episode? And if they have any questions about it, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Tupaloops. Yeah. Uh, regarding the Battle of the uh, Falklands, I was very surprised by the the high casualty numbers. Yeah. Um, especially from, you know, the sinking of Von Spee's crew. And, and I was wondering what happens to uh enemy survivors kind of like just floating out at sea are they just left there to drown or are they taken in as like prisoners of war what was the the mo back then on the uh allies uh side of things in world war one well if you saw the titanic i believe they're all floating on wooden doors and waiting uh and waiting to be rescued so luckily for those guys during world war one to my knowledge, every single nation respected maritime orders. So if anyone's in the water, you have to rescue them. In World War II, it was a completely different, uh, oh my God, it was a different bag of worms there. They would, if, depending on who it was, they would shoot the survivors of the ships, uh, particularly the Japanese, mind you. They would do a lot of awful stuff and the Germans too. And uh, But for World War One everybody who's in the water would have been saved by their own ships if it was possible first and if not by the enemy you weren't allowed to just uh leave men to die i mean it does happen mind you but you're not supposed to i find that uh super super interesting like uh one of the things i i was a little surprised and for the episode and i was very pleasantly surprised was uh, going back to World War I communication style and management, you have these five uh, battleships. They're in the Pacific. They're trying to find a way kind of back without with causing some trouble along the way. Uh, what would be the level of like communication slash response awareness that the Allies could have regarding such events? Is it a question of getting these reports weeks after the fact and then trying to you know, translocate these ships uh, in the middle of the Pacific? Uh, it's not exactly like you could have a satellite imagery at that time. As early as 1904, uh, Justin would remember, there was a war called the Russo-Japanese War, where radio tech had just kind of hit the forefront. And uh, it was actually a key element that allowed the Japanese to defeat the Russians. Uh, both sides had the technology, which was like kind of a newly emerged radio tech. But the Japanese had built their own radio tech, whereas the Russians had bought German tech without <laughs> translating a lot of the manuals. So they didn't know how to use it very well. So it's a combination of a few different things. And mind you, I'm not an expert in communication history. There is actually a museum uh, in Ontario just dedicated to communication, communication history. It's pretty interesting. But uh, Telegram would have been used for many messages going over land because it was actually technically the quickest way from anywhere in the world to get a message through. Uh, if they could radio any of the ships, it would be difficult because it's a distance question. But there's a lot of leapfrogging. leapfrogging. So depending on if you know where the ships are, if your allied ships are in proximity, they can leapfrog the message to get to you. But sometimes like you kind of have alluded to, if you get to port, maybe you'll get the message. If not, and you're out in the middle of the ocean, you might not have any clue what's going on. Communication was pretty new for World War I. A lot of uh, naval commanders didn't even know how to use it as well. So it depended on your captain. If your captain was really old school, he didn't abide by a lot of it. There was uh, there's one example in World War One that kind of makes me think about this. It was, I think it was just before the Battle of Gallipoli. They had a bunch of old, old captains on some very old, outdated ships that refused to use the radio tech, and they would use the old flag signals. That's where you raise certain flags on your ship to show the other ships that can actually physically see you with binoculars what you want the orders to be. And it caused such a colossal bit of mayhem that it really screwed up some battles. So communication World War One was a learning curve as well. Well, not to mention uh, when you're working off flag signals, it's not like other people can can't be looking at you with binoculars either. So yeah, that's a, a good point. A uh, little bit of telegraphing there, you know. I, I wish I was like a, a naval historian, mind you, and that might be shocking to people because I profess to be a specialist in the Pacific War, so you'd imagine, but um, I know more about actually the uh, the China War during 37 to 45, if anything else, 
but uh, I imagine I'm overlooking a lot of different uh, technological means. Uh, I'm sure there was other versions, like I'm sure there was other stuff for communication, but as far as I know, the leapfrogging of radio signals and the telegraph for the mainline connections, uh, they had sea cables that were cut in World War I <laughs> from the continents. So yeah, it would have been really tricky to send messages, particularly from Germany to anybody out in the Pacific. I, not too sure how they did it. They would have had to use neutral networks, which they did in this uh, in this circumstance. Uh, Chile was neutral, but they were feeding information to the Germans. Well, it seems to me like from the previous episodes we've done, that's been kind of a common theme. Is uh, the the their first line of attack is often not just all out bombardment; it's cutting resource and communication yeah. before anything. You know, which makes sense in a way. But uh, you see, they're always going to take out railway stations that cut off food supply, weapon supply, uh, things like that, cutting off communication, cutting off transportation. Like it seems to be that's their, the, the, that was one of the main things back, well, maybe still is today, but is, is just divide and conquer to start with. And you yeah. know, win, win in a war of attrition, then more, more so than in a war of force. Because I mean, you know, let's look at this in general. This is a very, bizarre topic we're talking about a german navy well a handful of ships really that are out stuck in the pacific and they're just commercial raiding so they're just attacking merchant ships and transport ships you you might think to yourself well how significant really is that but for a, a nation like australia who's moving like thousands of men upon troop ships the idea that one of these could get torpedoed or something is pretty terrifying it's uh, uh it, just the psychological fear of it is enough to move certain resources around to deal with the uh, situation, which we see in the episode with the, the single ship, the SMS Emden is doing such a great job that they literally have to hunt the son of a bitch down. So it's pretty surprising yeah. the resources just for one yeah. ship. Yeah. And that was my main comment on the episode is uh, Mr. Von Spee and the Emden there. Holy crap. That was the little ship that could. I mean, uh, he just went on an absolute rampage and did, got so much work done with just one ship. Well, and uh, yeah, help. obviously they went down in the end, but uh, holy crap. I also felt it was an inter interesting factoid how both of Von Spee's sons um, were like part of his crew. Yeah. And they all died on the same day. Were they like on the same ship as him or what? what was going on there? Uh, if, to my recollection, they were on the same ship, so they were following in their dad's footsteps, which is pretty dark and unfortunate, given that Von Spee kind of committed suicide, if you think about it. He didn't have to go into that last battle, and he chose to, so it seems like he wanted to go out in a blaze of glory, and he took his sons and hundreds of men with him. Yeah. Was yeah. this a catastrophic defeat for the for the German Navy, the losing of these raiders? Like, would things have turned out differently if instead of going on this raiding spree, they had just returned straight to Germany? Was it a war-winning moment? I No, I, I would not say so. Um, was it a moment of losing morale? Yes, because it was a good propaganda tool, especially with the SMS Emden. It was a single ship raising terror i think in the episode i show some newspaper clips like people like, they were losing their mind india got attacked for like the first time in its history by a by like a, a naval ship at madras and it, it freaked out the entire nation the british empire was like oh my god can't believe the amount of damage one ship did australia was freaking out australia sent out the uh the sydney to go hunt it down in the end uh but the royal navy was scrambling around to try and find these ships the japanese were scrambling around the entire time yet never found the ships which i find pretty peculiar in the end uh but yeah no um von Spee should have simply ran back to, to germany if he could i mean it would have been probably impossible to get past the blockade that would have been in the north sea because germany was blockaded during world war one they weren't getting out right. but uh yeah the falkland islands was uh you could say it was a naval disaster in the fact that they were surprise attacked. Von Spee had the opportunity when he was going near the, the port, he could have like sacrificed one of his ships right in front of the port and blocked that fleet from even chasing him. If he wanted to make a good escape, he could have actually just attacked them while they were at port because they were calling up. So even though those ships were superior to his force, 
they were in a really bad situation. They wouldn't have been able to shoot at him back properly. So he kind of really screwed up. Yeah, but I mean, screwed up in a sense, you know, and you're talking about how it was it really a loss for Germany, though? No, when you think about no. how much damage they did. They did colossal damage. They That's... it's the amount of resources the other nations had to put forward to contain the issue in the Pacific. That was completely unnecessary. Like uh, the other yeah. episode that came before this, Britain is begging Japan to enter the war because they want them to help with naval issues. They want them to patrol the Mediterranean Sea because the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans are doing too much damage with submarines. And they want them to get rid of the uh, the squadron that's in the Pacific, in which the Japanese don't do any of that and just steal a bunch of islands and do what they want to do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I want to go ahead. I just wanted to mention about uh, uh, this uh, this whole issue regarding uh, the propaganda of the the Emden and just that one ship and just the, the the German raiders in the Pacific in general and the amount of damage they're about to do. I mean, the traditional narrative from you know where the British side of history would say that you know at that point it was they were the empire that where the sun never sets because yeah. of their and a lot of that was based on their naval uh, superiority uh, or so called superiority in that time and uh, I found it very interesting that you know just the, the ability regardless of the uh, the long-term success rate of those raiders uh, just the Emden being able to do all that damage uh, you know creating that narrative uh, you know all of a sudden you do have to adjust whether it's a rational military response or a communications uh, containment strategy of your own people to create to stop having panic you know maybe you have to reallocate resources you know inefficiently in order to contain that situation and then maybe causing openings in other parts of the war that may not have previously been there yep yep and the ironically uh it'll be said by none other than adolf hitler was one of the most famous people to say this but germany really dropped the ball during world war one when it came to the use of propaganda so you would imagine this great venture of the uh, the SMS Emden or just the East Asia squadron in general would have been like really oomphed up a lot and really like struck at the allies to embarrass them. But uh, the allies were much better at the propaganda game. So in the end, I don't know the story myself, but I do wonder how much the propaganda fed into anything, but let alone the, the sinking and stealing and, uh, yeah, stealing particularly of any vessels in the Pacific was pretty much the most significant point because I don't even really go in. I couldn't go into it in the episode, but there's actually a few other handfuls of German ships that operate in the Pacific as raiders as well that single-handedly took a lot of ships themselves. Like there's a ship called the SMS Wolf. It's uh, not only did it take down like a ton of ships, it took like almost 500 prisoners with it and it got back to Germany. Which is really? a pretty yeah, it's a pretty surprising story wow. that they took prisoners and took them back home, and uh, they end up like they end up as one ship, and they're like let's say they're a cruiser, but they steal a bunch of merchant ships. They try to arm them, and then they kind of have like this little pirate fleet that's following them everywhere, being crewed by a skeleton crew, as in like a few people. But uh, yeah, for propaganda purposes, uh, I know that the SMS Emden did have a significant role in terrorizing the allies particularly australia because it's in australian newspapers and new zealand newspapers you would have saw it the most because it was honestly something that was messing with them because there was the idea that these ships might be putting mines in front of the harbors in australia new zealand or in just like the indian ocean uh okay. the sms emden didn't actually put any mines but other german ships that were operating that i didn't talk about did put mines around and they took out quite a few warships it's pretty terrifying stuff well that's not nice I also, um, I didn't get to say this because it's a YouTube episode and the the naval battle of the Falkland Islands is pretty climatic in a way, but uh, I think you might have noticed there was a German ship that got away in the end. It was the SMS Dresden. Right. It managed to escape. And technically, mm -hmm. it had this other battle that will occur later that would be like the definitive last battle of the, the raiders in the Pacific. The battle was called uh, the Battle of Masatera. And it was basically the Dresden was kind of looking to uh, raid in the Indian Ocean because 
the Entente powers had blocked them from getting over to Germany. So this guy, the SMS Dresden just went right back into the Pacific Ocean and they were just going to raid because they had nothing else to do. And they were followed by two of the British ships that were involved in the Falkland naval battle, the, uh, the HMS Kent and Glasgow. So the, uh, the Dresden, I can't remember where it landed. Yeah, I, I did have notes on this somewhere. Let's look. I, I wrote something about this. The Dresden tried to dock somewhere. Can't remember where it was. They ended up docking somewhere in the Pacific, and then they were taken by surprise by uh, the two ships. So in the end, the Dresden didn't have much ammunition left because they had fought the Falkland, Island, Falkland Islands battle. Didn't have any more coal, couldn't really move. So the Dresden just decided to kind of scuttle itself, and they... That was the last battle. It would have been not a great way to end the YouTube episode I found, so I, I didn't put it. It's kind of okay. anticlimactic, I guess. Hmm. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of uh, tactics, though, that we were talking about before, I'm going to loop back to it a bit. One thing I noticed in this episode that we've talked about previously, but I'm surprised was so used and worked so well, is the good old uh, flying a false flag. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> The, the 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 you know I understand this is not the the this is not the 20th century and technology may not be the greatest but how can you take a German steel warship put a put a false flag on it and pretend that it's like a trading ship from another country or something like that like I can understand maybe it happening once or so but it seems like this happened a lot back in those times and I don't yeah. understand how they got away with it so much so um, a lot of <laughs> A lot of the people that are working in the Navy in World War One, basically one of the few things you could see that would dignify what a ship was, was how many chimney stacks it had. That was the first thing you saw. And then when you looked at it, it might look like any ship. You might think, oh, it's in my own armada. So for the Germans, it's, it's true. Like the SMS Emden did it. They would put on like a British flag. They went to a British port to try and call up or they put up a French flag and uh, yeah, they would dock and then shoot everybody and then try and steal the coal and get away. It, uh, it was pretty prevalent in World War One. In World War II, uh, the Germans did it again, uh, usually with really? like, yeah, they would put up Dutch flags and stuff and they would pretend that they were like Dutch vessels for the Dutch East Indies and they would try and raid and get away with it. It was pretty funny. There was a huge affair in World War II before uh, Japan got into the war where the Germans would do these false flag operations and then they would run to the port of Japan for to get to safety. And uh, the Americans and, and British and everyone was pretty angry about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, like I said, the number of stacks or not, it just, I can understand if you're, you're masquerading a German warship as a British warship. Okay. But uh, you even mentioned in the episode that one of them went off as like, a, I don't remember if it was a lumber ship or something like that. Oh, I didn't get to talk about that. Uh, so there was a ship that um, managed to get past the blockade that was in front of the uh, the German port. So it had to get uh, out of the North Sea. And in order to do so, it pretended to be a Norwegian lumber ship. And everybody on the crew, in the crew could, could speak uh, Norwegian to boot because they were boarded by the British who checked them. And apparently they did such a good job that they got out of the Atlantic. They made their way eventually into the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they raided first the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, then the Pacific Ocean, and then I think they made it back to Germany. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was the SMS Wolf that did that, or mm, I can't remember which ship managed to do that. Uh, I think it was the SMS Seedler, maybe. Yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you a question uh, mm -hmm. about the episode. I thought it really interesting. So you have the, the German Raiders, they're crossing the Pacific. They have a series of successes. Um, the first thing I would like to I would know is, you know, given the communication at the time, you talk about the radio technology and stuff. Do you think uh, that they, as they're crossing the Pacific, they're learning about the success of the Emden because he kind of given the okay at the beginning to, you know, steer that one off to go raise some havoc. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, what that thought, thing I thought was really interesting is you obviously have um, a series of battles in which the German Raiders are successful. And I, I was wondering, do you feel that that could have played into the psychological bravado of the, the Raiders themselves and that they maybe bit off a little bit more than they could chew going into that last battle and then, uh, you know, even maybe catching them off guard? 
they uh, still maybe didn't optimize the way they could have uh, to have uh, succeeded or done more damage. I thought it was like a really interesting series of successes and then kind of running into a, like, a, uh oh, uh, we were, were a bit outnumbered here and then uh, not really adjusting properly. I thought that I was, you know, kind of wondering what the psychological part of that might be. Yeah, i not sure if I mentioned in the episode, but when the East Asia Squadron with Von Spee made it to a port in Chile, I believe, they found out about the fate of the SMS Emden. So they had no knowledge that the Emden had been taken down by the Sydney until that point, which would have been quite late. Uh, it would have been quite a while after the Emden had been taken down. So it's funny you mentioned that because then I look at it when they went to port in Chile, they had just recently come off of a victory, a major one too. And uh, Von Spee, that's when he kind of makes this famous quote where someone gives him this really nice bouquet of flowers and he goes, well, that'll be nice on my grave. So I think, <laughs> I think for Von Spee, it did feed into his mind because uh, he did what he did. But uh, it was at that point that they decided to try and make a breakaway to get back to Germany. So to get past the, uh, the Cape in South America. So I think, yeah, I think the communication, I think when the Emden went down, it, it signified to them that their time was up, needed to get out of there. Certainly. Hmm. You got to yeah, imagine uh, for these guys in ships, they're surface fleet ships. I don't talk about any submarines in this episode. The submariners... They're out in the middle of nowhere with no communication, just like living like in a tube. It's it must have been so much worse. Maybe so, but I do understand what uh, what Nick's getting at too. It makes a lot of sense that you get that. Uh, what do they call that in sports? The hot hand fallacy or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the hot yeah. hand fallacy. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's uh, you get on a run and you you kind of get that invincible feeling, you know, and the next thing. Next thing you know, you kind of run into a wall and go, oops, that's yeah. not good. So uh, I, I think he's got a point there. That uh, that may definitely have played a part in it. I It's because before I did this episode, I honestly, I'll admit, I was not very knowledgeable about the actions of uh, the German Navy in the Pacific. Uh, I don't think many people are. I mean, I'm quite a World War One history buff, but it's a sideline. It's it's almost never talked about. You only hear about, oh, yeah, Japan really came out on top. They took a few islands. They attacked Tsingtao, and that was that. You don't really hear much about the German raiders. So I think von Spee, unlike the rest of his crew, I believe he just realized the jig was up. And I think that he realized once the SMS Emden had been taken down by that ship in question, that whatever was coming after them was going to be significant finally. Because when he fought the previous guy before the Falkland Islands, the guy royally screwed up when he came after uh, Von Spee. I think Von Spee realized that they got lucky, really lucky. And that the next time, like if, if, if they didn't get out clean, that they were going to be all obliterated because the british yeah. like you know the only thing the only advantage they really had was that no significant warships were after them the these are all the b team you know like whatever australia was throwing at them new zealand or i mean japan had the a team but japan didn't seem to make a real effort to find them i i've never really looked into it mind you but uh yeah no they they had it easy for a while and then when the royal navy sent two significant ships uh well it was devastating yeah, well, I don't remember the numbers, but you went over it in the episode how much they outgunned the original people they sent after them. And oh, then when yeah. they sent the yeah. big boys, it was like, okay, now we got to get out of here or we're pretty toast. Well, we're talking also about battleships, well, dreadnoughts, battleships, battle cruisers, etc. World War One has an awkward stage when it comes to war vessels and uh, Von Spiel and cruisers. So these are the medium ships, we'll call them. And yeah. the, he the heavies came out. And when it comes to warships like this the uh, the mediums can't really take on the heavies at all light ships like destroyers might torpedo the heavies but uh, no these cruisers would not be able to right right because they're just outranged and outgunned so they can't really do anything yeah it's funny because you know you say in a script like oh they have like 17 inch guns or 15 inch guns You're like well what does that really mean oh it means a lot <laughs> it means like either the shell's going right through your hull or it's going to bounce right off that was something yeah. that really got my attention uh, was the whole discussion around uh, gun types and the size and uh, the range. Uh, I was maybe a little bit caught off guard myself at the range they had uh, yeah. in World War One. When you start talking about 6,500 yards, 5,500 yards, 10,000 yards, 
you know, I thought it was like, wow, this is, you're able to do battle from quite the distance uh, at that point in time in history. I thought it was very, uh, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I was wondering like what kind of, without, we maybe don't know the full naval specs of everything like that, but uh, when you have that kind of range distance, I imagine it has to be just an absolute game changer. Yeah, well, in the Falkland Islands battle, uh, the Germans, unfortunately, were out, they were outgunned, outsped because the other ships could catch them much quicker and the germans were forced at a point where if they tried to just run away they couldn't and they're already being fired upon so they had to get closer in to be able to fire themselves but by getting closer in they only allowed the british to shoot them much more accurately so inevitably it caused their doom like they were torn to pieces it was a brutal battle it's uh it's a uh, pretty it's it's pretty sad it's a sad way to go down to be honest yeah, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure these guys, uh, they, they had training and they knew what they were doing. But when you're talking about two ships, two moving ships on a moving ocean with World War One equipment trying to hit each other with long range weapons at 10,000 yards. I mean, that's not exactly a bullseye every time. You know what I mean? No, and they're doing math by hand. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Well, yeah it, they're, it's they're, incredible. They're... Yeah. Oh, that's cool. What, they didn't have Android back then or what? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah, so you see that that that's the issue. But all of a sudden, when you're getting in closer range, and those, you know, every shell is landing closer and closer and closer, and you're going, okay, how close can we get until we get popped, right? Yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, that's almost like a giant game of chicken right there. I haven't heard in a while from YouTube. So uh, got anything to throw into the melting pot of all this? Yeah. One thing that caught my eye watching a video, it actually has, it's more of like from a video making technical side of things, but uh, how, how did you uh, do that whole like world map overview? Uh, oh, this is going to be a funny one. Uh, that's a, definitely a new addition to the channel, I think. Thank you for asking me that question. Cause like, it's the most embarrassing part of my channel, especially when I work with Kings and generals who, God, they just say, <laughs> Uh, they blow me right out of the water to say the least um i'm using a free to use software called fire alpaca if you've ever heard of it and what i did was i took google earth maps so the actual terrain maps and then i just literally drew my own like i used like flags for this one particularly to like take the the border lines of the countries and i'll use like the flag that represents the time period in that and that's about it when it comes to the ocean battles it's it's just google earth ocean that it's actually that's that part's easy and what about the uh, naval vessels oh that one was uh interesting for this uh if anybody's a naval historian they would probably see right away there's a ton of 3d models out there that a lot of really intense people have made for like just about any ship you can imagine so it's world war one world war two even going back to like the 18th century so i just took a lot of like pictures of their models and if i could get the real ship's model I'll take a picture of it and I'll like, you know, um, cut it out, make it smaller, attach it to a squadron and then place it. And then I'll go through, I'm using Final Cut Pro for mine. I'm not using Adobe, which I should. Uh, half the ships are the actual ships. And then a bunch of them are clones. Cool. But they're made by other people. And I know some people might say, oh, you should probably give credit to them. But I'd be giving credit to hundreds and hundreds of people at this point. It'd be hard. <laughs> Actually, be easier if I just use World of Warships ships, but I bet you they'd come after me if I did. Or they maybe maybe they'll sponsor me. That'd be great. That could be a creative way. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be pretty creative uh, for you to, to roll that uh, element. But it was actually cool. I mean, uh, I personally jumping on tubes is uh, uh, comment there. I thought it was. Yeah, I thought that was really a neat part of the episode. I was kind of looking at that and kind of seeing them move around and stuff. And it was very, very to me, it was visually appealing. I thought it was uh, pretty good and just something I didn't know a lot about. So I was kind of trying to get a scope of things and then you're talking you know five thousand yards six thousand yards ten thousand yard shots and i'm like wow this is uh well beyond uh you know uh, my initial knowledge of this, this stuff so i thought it really really interesting yeah you know what i'm gonna take a i'm gonna drive us through another section because the one thing that i know when i asked my audience with a, a poll the one thing that they wanted the most from these podcasts is for me to answer audience questions Mind you, for this episode, I didn't get too many questions, but I, I kind of carried on some questions I found from the previous episode because uh, this is a, it was supposed to be a four-part series. Now it's a five-part series, and I'll explain why later, of World War One in Asia. 
So the first question I got, and it's ironic because I get this question for every single video I put out is what movie or series were you using for all the clips that you uh, had in this episode? I get this all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, It turns out that there's like, as you can imagine, almost no movies about German raiders during World War I. Uh, but I found a single movie, which was uh, Zimana de Emden. So it's a, it's a movie on the Emden. Unfortunately, it's a romance movie. Uh, so <laughs> I think it was two hours long. And the first 15 minutes were actually about the ship doing stuff. So every ounce of footage in my episode is showing that. And then I couldn't really use the rest of the movie. Um, other than that, I've been guilty of using a single series for most of my episodes. And uh, it goes all the way back to the Sino-Japanese War, the first one, and the Russo-Japanese War. And the series uh, in Japanese, it's called Sake no U no Kumo. Uh, basically, it was a Japanese miniseries that covered a uh, time period. And halfway through, it shows the entire Russo-Japanese War. Can't recommend it highly enough. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. And it shows the Battle of Tushima. So in this episode, if you see all of a sudden a cinematic like battleship firing its cannons, it's usually the Battle of Tsushima from that series I was using to answer that audience question. Uh, All these aren't questions, mind you. Some of them are just like really funny comments I had to talk about. Uh, But I did have another question, which was, can you make a video about the Canadian Navy during World War II and possibly in the Pacific too? They're so underappreciated goes without saying we're all canadians here uh canada bore the biggest brunt of the atlantic shipping we're the ones who figured out actually might be a a hot topic to talk about but canadians are actually the ones who figured out how to take down the u-boats in the end when it came to getting our convoys across the atlantic during world war ii to my knowledge i don't know if there was any canadian warships in the pacific because I know that the Japanese were so bold, they actually attacked Vancouver at one point. Yeah, they did. Attacked. It's a, it's a minor, small little thing that they did. They, they shot at a lighthouse. But yes, they attacked our, our territory. So I don't think the Canadian Navy did too much in the Pacific other than like hunting for a few submarines off the coast. Because like in, uh, even for the Americans, the Californian coast, for the beginning of the war, a bunch of Japanese submarines just kind of rained havoc on merchant ships. So other than that, that might be it. But maybe I'm wrong. I'll look into it. By my knowledge, I've never really heard about any Canadian naval vessels doing too much in the Pacific, but I might be wrong. Another comment or question. uh, Question. I'll read it out. Never knew the Germans would raid Asian waters in World War I. I thought they'd simply disappear after the Allies took the German colonies. I know about the German raiders in Asia during World War II, though. As I can imagine uh, from this comment, every like a lot, a lot more people know about the German raiders of World War II because I don't know uh, it's it's a subject that just people know more about. Like World War One in Asia is like a really niche subject that almost no one knows about. My next episode is going to be on uh, China during World War One, and I doubt anyone knows anything about that. Uh, let's go into the next question here. So many videos are popping up about German Raiders last few days. Is there a movie coming out or something? Don't know, but uh, honestly, it's uh, it seems so. Like, I don't understand why all of a sudden people are talking about German Raiders. If It's a hot topic all of a sudden. I saw a bunch of stuff on my own YouTube when I was looking up stuff making this episode. I guess I just hit it while it was hot. Uh, another question was, when will we see a Vietnamese episode? So this one I can go into quite a bit. Uh, to let you guys know and the audience know, when I started this, I was going to do a four-part series for World War One in Asia. So it was going to be uh, the Battle of Tsing Tsao, the German Raiders of the Pacific, this one, China during World War One, and Japan during World War One. But this guy who just messaged this question for the Vietnamese uh, episode Uh, He's not the only person to ask. I've had so many guys ask me to do some uh, content for kind of like the Vietnamese Franco Wars because France and Vietnam had terrible relationship for like almost 100 years. 
And uh, I decided like, once I got this message, um, I look into it and lo and behold, even I didn't know this myself, uh, Vietnam had an extremely important role in World War I, arguably more important than a lot of other Asian nations. They actually fought quite a bit, not to say anything we of Japan. Like oh, what? I said, yeah, we were talking about that uh, off camera last time. Yeah, and uh, I was surprised myself. I didn't know this. I knew that France had, you know, used uh, Asian laborers, such as the, the Chinese and stuff. I didn't know that they incorporated them into the military. So it, I did my research. Turns out that quite a lot of Vietnamese, a few Cambodians, and a lot of Thai uh, did fight in World War One. So I have already written the episode, and it's going to come out as the fifth part of this series. I'll be calling it probably Southeast Asians during World War One because I think not that it's inaccurate to call them French Indo-Chinese. I don't think it's respectful to call them that. So I'm going to call them Southeast Asians and it's coming. So you have been heard. Uh, let's see. I think I got another comment. Oh yeah. I had a comment here that I had to add to this episode because it was interesting and it goes, if only the United States was on the side of the central powers, we wouldn't have had a fascist Japan rising later. Oh, Jesus. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to assume it's a Japanese individual. Alternate history question. Interesting. Maybe Japan really hated the United States, and especially during World War One. So maybe. And uh, the last question, question i got up uh, here was uh can we get a video on the sino french war uh, actually it was you justin it says here yeah you sent this I question i replied to it okay okay because i i had just written down on like a google doc yeah i replied to it that'd, that'd be something i'd be interested in looking into but uh, i don't know if we have time to add it to the series or not but we might be I'm able to make a separate episode on it you know, I definitely might have time to add it to the series because, as anyone can guess, it's been a little bit awkward now that I've joined Kingsman Generals and I'm doing the Pacific War week to week. So I'm trying to find my own legs, so to speak. So maybe I will delve back into it because it's a, it's more back in time to start off with the Franco uh, with the Franco Vietnamese wars and stuff. But uh, it is interesting. Um, it's something a lot of people in the West wouldn't have heard about. Uh, the French were horrible to Asians <laughs> really bad <laughs> the Vietnam War that we know today uh that's that was because of France actually it all comes back to colonial rule and a lot of wars and terrible stuff that happened long history huh. all right so God, it's it's so much different from our other podcasts. I actually like how this format's going, and I hope the audience likes it. I think we'll take this time just to, you know, allow you guys to talk a little bit more about your YouTube channels to try and uh, see if we can snag a few more viewers for you guys. Tubes, if you want to say, what are you working on now? Uh, yeah, now I'm playing um, Amnesia Rebirth. Been on, like, a string of, like, survival horror games. And... Yeah, that, that's pretty much been it from my side. Uh, what about you, Nick? Well, we have uh, really interesting developments coming in the Canadian political scene. As uh, Canadians know, we went to the polls in September. Uh, we decided we were going to take two months to get back to Parliament. So we'll be back on November 22nd. And uh, there'll be more Canadian news. Canada Watch here is going to attempt to break it down in a way that does not spin the issues at hand. It can be difficult when uh, dealing with parliament, so we'll have to navigate those waters. And uh, looking forward to talking more about uh, supply chain issues and inflation. Uh, major, major issues in Canada right now. Uh, I work in logistics uh, for what I do on my day to day. And let me tell you, there's stuff coming down the pipe that is really, really interesting. Uh, I'm about 120 days ahead in the supply chain. Yeah, for me, the most interesting stuff would be the any items related to like the inflation rates, because I find it fascinating what specific items we're seeing being hit the most like when they put up like even on Twitter, just like a chart, like what we're seeing is like the highest things that are going up I'm like, geez, it's gonna get rough soon. <laughs> we uh, as a small note on that, uh, we we follow closely 
uh, Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem. He uh, makes comments on inflation regularly. And uh, he had been saying for quite some time now, yes, this inflation is uh, transitory. It'll be uh, just short lived. And then uh, he made a little bit of a uh, verbal gaffe uh, the other day, which people are catching up on. He said, uh, in this inflation period is going to be tough, transitory, but not necessarily short lived. So he uh, will have to get some more details on that and we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on it. I think anyone who is living in the United States and Canada right now can certainly acknowledge that prices are up and have salaries followed. I think that's a very disputable fact. Yeah. Well, I mean, we knew we knew when we saw how bad this was that we were going to be feeling a ripple for a long time and was going to branch out a little bit everywhere. But uh, working in the restaurant industry myself, I can tell you the price of bacon and salads suck right now. Not happy with it at all. So, and that's uh, that's just one thing from one industry. So, yeah, it's uh, I have I'm actually looking forward to seeing what you have to say on that on a more national scale, Nick, because it's uh, I, I think it's going to get worse and for the foreseeable future. So, I think one of my that's favorite things about this is people are actually going to learn uh, something that they may have not heard of. It's maybe that the government is not taxing you accordingly, but uh, well, with inflation, yeah, you are paying taxes in the end. It's going to be an eye opener for a lot of, a lot of different classes of people and society soon. I think we're all going to be feeling pain for at least two more years. Uh, out of curiosity, what what are some of these items that uh, have already seen huge uh, price spikes? Well, have you bought a tank of gas in the last two weeks? Uh, two? I, I have not. So, <laughs> pretty bad. Eighty yeah, yeah, percent year over year gas right now. Gas wow, really crazy. Uh, Justin is 100% on point with his, uh, his analysis of the restaurant industry right now. Uh, real, uh, I, I consider to be a high level of unfairness towards that industry. Uh, it is the price of bacon, the price of meat, uh, dairy products. The Canadian Dairy Commission announced uh, last week that they are recommending, which is the national set price on dairy, an 8% increase, never before seen before next year. And they have openly acknowledged that they expect that the price of uh, butter, cheese, and milk will be up 15 to 20 percent next year alone. So that is uh, yeah, going to be that. quite unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. Very challenging. Okay. Yeah, but when you think about it too, I mean, you know, I'm joking because I am in the restaurant industry, but that's not something that just affects the restaurant industry. When you talk about butter, cheese, and milk, that's every household. That's every. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's with the up. Of a few lactose intolerant people that, uh, that that's affecting everybody's pocket at the end of the day. And I mean, 15 to 20 percent. Holy crap. That's nutty. Well, I'm going to stop us all here. This has been actually probably one of the best podcasts that we've ever done. Honestly, I, I'm so happy that this format's come about. Please check out Canada Watch over top left and Tupa Loops bottom left. What's the official name of your associated channel? Of our Let's Play channel, it is yeah. uh, the Adventure Allies. And the Adventure Allies. I'm gonna have both icons in both corners of your screen, so cool. you'll be able to see. Thanks. Thank you, uh, channels, guys. Check them out. Thank you, YouTube list, Justin. Maybe one day you'll dabble into the small YouTube business where we make no money and cry every night. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this has been the Pacific War Channel. Please, if you have any comments or you want to see anything from this channel, go on YouTube and send it because where else is it going to be seen? Unless you're part of Kings and Generals Discord and then you can yell at me there because I'll definitely find that information. Over and out.